lab exam, lab practical one review. So we just finished with uh, Unit 5, Chapter 5, Microscopy. So now we're moving into Unit 6, Chapter 6, Cast of Characters. Um, and I think maybe this is um, maybe a unit where folks, some folks are a little bit concerned about because of classification. So you guys, on Canvas, I put up partial keys or partial keys to um, some of our lab study guide homework questions. Um, so I filled in this table on the key, and I think what I'd like to do is just move to the images because that's, that's what you'll be seeing on the lab exam is you'll have either microscopes or images with questions. And I hope this won't drive you crazy because what I'll do with each of the images is I'll go through the classification mantra, which I know might drive you crazy, but those are, um, those are good ways to test yourselves to see if you're, you're getting the main, the main points for the lab exam. Vocabulary, you guys, so biodiversity, this is a reflection of the genetic variation in populations. Taxonomy is this, the study, the science of classifying organisms. Phylogeny is the study of the evolutionary relationships between organisms. Now that we have DNA and RNA sequencing, now we can use phylogeny as a basis of taxonomy. Binomial nomenclature literally, literally means a two-name naming system. Um, this is the system that Linnaeus developed to give a unique name to every cellular organism. So um, in binomial nomenclature, let me see if I can actually type in here. Okay, so for example, humans are homo, that's the genus, and the genus is always capitalized. And then um, our specific epithet or species name is sapiens. And we always want to make sure the scientific name appears different from surrounding text. So I, if I'm using the word processor, I'd like to um, italicize this. And of course, my word processor is not going to let me do that. Or if I'm writing on an exam, I want to um, underline it. So that's going to be the... Um, the convention to make the scientific name look different from surrounding text. And like here where I'm having trouble, like my can't get my italics function to come up. All right. What you can do is having trouble like this is you could put these little lines on either side. And that's another key, another clue that you're talking about a unique scientific name. And these scientific names are, are used worldwide. So it doesn't matter what language we speak. Everybody will know Homo sapiens is a scientific name for humans. And again, here you guys were just practicing to correctly write Bacillus anthracis. The genus name Bacillus is capitalized. Um, anthracis, the specific epithet or species name is lowercase. And you guys know I'm just I'm just so bad at computers because right up here is what I was looking for. Yeah, I'm just a little slow. So again, I'm going to italicize them, um, indicating that it's a scientific name. All right. Okay, folks. So these are just some hints. Like people say, how can I, how can I memorize, you know, which organism is which? So look at cell sizes. Look at cell shapes. Look at cell arrangements. Look at unique structures. Okay. And I just gave some hints up here. These are some of the some of the ways I try to remember my little cast of characters. So you guys, so again, I'm gonna go through the classification mantra. And be aware, you guys, the images or slides that we put on the lab exam might not be exactly the ones that um, we've shown you on Canvas or in lab, because again, if you know the information, you should be able to look at a different slide of the organism or see a different um, photomicrograph and still be able to identify the organism given a description. So you guys read the lab exam qu questions carefully. There's lots of, of clues in the actual lab exam questions that will help you with identification of the organism. So again, you guys, I'll just do, um, I'll do the classification mantra 
So here, here you guys, I could, a I could ask this question. Um, this is the pathogen that causes TSEs. So I could ask you, what are TSEs? So remember, they're transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. I could ask you to identify the pathogen, and these would be the disease-causing prions. Um, and I could ask you, what are they made of? And you could say misfolded protein. And then we'll do the classification mantra. So are prions cellular or acellular? They're acellular. Are they prokaryotes or eukaryotes? They're neither, right? Because we only use prokaryotes, eukaryotes for cellular organisms. Which domain do they belong to? None. <laughs> Which kingdom do they belong to? None, right? They're acellular. And let's see here. We could ask, do um, prions have DNA or RNA? And the answer is no, right? Are they easy to destroy um, under normal autoclave conditions? The answer is no, right? Normal autoclaving won't destroy them. Um, will they be inactivated by alcohol, right? No, they won't. So they're some of the most resistant biological structures known. Now you guys will move over here, and we'd have to share with you, this is an electron micrograph of a pathogen isolated maybe from a patient with respiratory symptoms, right? And do remember, you guys, we can only ask you um, um, organisms or um, agents that we've studied in lab. So this is electron um, micrograph of an agent causing respiratory signs. So this would be our influenza virus, cellular or acellular. acellular. Um, do, does influenza virus have DNA or RNA? Yes, they have RNA, right? Um, Let's see here, um, which domain? No domain, right? Because they're acellular. Which kingdom? No kingdom, right? Are they prokaryotes or eukaryotes? They're neither because they're acellular. Would normal autoclaving destroy them? Yes, viruses will definitely be destroyed by normal autoclaving. So that's good news for us. Um, this is just a repeat from the unit 5 microscopy. This is urethral exudate with Neisseria gonorrhea, sexually transmitted. Here is the host, um, PMN, neutrophil. You can see the multilobe nucle nucleus. These are the first responders. Their job is to arrive and quickly try to phagocytize the invading bacteria. And, and we can see here the Neisseria gonorrhea, the little diplococci inside the cytoplasm of the neutrophil. So this little guy's trying to kill the Neisseria. So let's see here. Let's classify Neisseria gonorrhea. Cellular or acellular? They're cellular. Multicellular or unicellular? Unicellular. Prokaryotes or eukaryotes? Prokaryotes. Which domain? Domain bacteria. If this was a gram stain and Neisseria are staining red, are they gram negative or gram positive? They are they are gram negative, thin layer peptoglycan with an outer membrane with lipopolysaccharide in it. Would they be destroyed by normal autoclaving? Yes. Okay, let's classify this human cell. So cellular, acellular, um, cellular, eukaryote, prokaryote, or obviously eukaryotes because here's the multilobe nucleus. Eukaryotes, multicellular, which domain? Domain eukaryote, which kingdom? Kingdom animalia. And remember, you guys, is members of kingdom animalia, we don't have a cell wall. And that's why human cells are going to stain um, red in the gram stain, right? Because they get decolorized. There's no cell wall to hold the crystal violet iodine inside. Um, Neisseria, gonorrhea, they can be killed with antibiotics. Um, we'll just stop there. Okay. They are becoming antibiotic resistant, but that would be a whole, I think, a whole nother. Um, lecture. And then another of our cast of characters, you guys, I would have to tell you, this is an organism that was isolated maybe from a cow that had died of anthrax. So provide the scientific name, Bacillus anthracis, cellular or acellular, cellular, um, unicellular or multicellular, unicellular, prokaryote or eukaryote, prokaryote, which domain? Domain bacteria. Um, Bacillus anthracis have cell walls made with thick, thick layers of peptoglycan, so they're going to stain what color in the gram stain? They would stain purple. Each individual cell is a rod shape or cigar shaped cell or sausage shaped cell, so we call that a bacillus. And 
bacillus anthracis, when they divide, they remain connected, forming these long chains. And we use the prefix strepto for a chain. So bacillus anthracis forms um, streptobacilli. These chains are called streptobacilli. Very important, you guys, what are these oval structures that aren't staining? Those are the tough-resistant endospores that can survive for decades, maybe centuries, in the environment and the soil. Remember, the process of forming the endospore is called sporulation. And then um, if the endospore is in an environment that's moist and warm and has nutrients, it'll germinate to release the pathogenic, metabolically active bacteria. The endospores are so tough and resistant, they, they usually don't gram stain. Right. Will endospores be um, destroyed by normal autoclaving? Yes. That's why the autoclave was developed, was to destroy endospores. In, in um, humans, there's three forms of um, anthrax, depending on how we get infected with the endospores. The endospores are usually the infectious form. If the endospores get into a cut, we'll end up with cutaneous anthrax. If we inhale the endospores, we'll end up with inhalation anthrax. If we eat animal tissue from an animal that's died of anthrax, we ingest the endospores, we'll end up with gastrointestinal anthrax. The endospores aren't destroyed by boiling, so cooking often won't destroy them. If the infections are caught early, you can treat successfully with antibiotics. So cutaneous is probably the easiest to treat, but inhalation and gastrointestinal anthrax um, are often rapidly fatal. Then you guys were going to go down here. Um, I could say this was a specimen collected from pond scum. And so we're seeing these little chains of green cells with an occasional larger cell here. So any idea who this is? If it's a bacterium, it's green, it has chlorophyll A, so we know it's a cyanobacterium. The only cyanobacterium we've studied so far is no stock. Right? So again, cellular, unicellular, prokaryote, domain bacteria. Um, chlorophyll A means they are photoautotrophs. Chlorophyll A means in the presence of light, they carry out oxygenic photosynthesis, producing sugars and molecular oxygen from carbon dioxide and water in the presence of light and the chlorophyll A. Right? What's this larger cell, this different cell? This is the heterocyte, and you'll recall that contains nitrogenase for nitrogen fixation, taking molecular nitrogen, converting it to ammonia. And the reason the cyanobacteria require a different cell for nitrogen fixation is, remember, nitrogenase is inactivated by molecular oxygen, so the nitrogenase couldn't function in these photosynthetic cells. Good. All right, you guys, so now we're going to keep going. So this is a, um, maybe from that same pond, we um, found this organism. This looks like this could be a wet mount of this organism. It's a lot bigger than our no stock. Okay, so notice the cytoplasmic extens extensions. These are called pseudopods. So this is our amoeba proteus, amoeba proteus. Um, some of you had prepared slides that were stained with these fluorescent colors. Just recognize that's a stain. It's not how they appear in nature. So amoeba proteus, cellular or acellular? It's cellular. Is it uh, eukaryote or prokaryote? There's a nucleus, so we know it's a eukaryote and it belongs to domain eukarya. It's unicellular, a unicellular eukaryote that is neither a plant, nor a fungus, nor an animal. So it's one of the protists with a lower, a lower case P. It's an animal-like protist, a protozoan. It lacks a cell wall. It's a chemoheterotroph. It's a hunter. It has an ingestive form of nutrition. And it's motile. It can move by these cool pseudopods. And the pseudopods are also used in the process of phagocytosis. If we gram stained an amoeba proteus, it would gram stain red because it doesn't have a cell wall. Then we'll go over here, folks. This is the spirogyra. In the old days, we had this classified as a plant-like protist and algae, but um, 
it is now classified as a member of Kingdom Plantae. So right off the bat, we know it's um, a eukaryote, domain eukarya, and again, you guys, it's been reclassified to Kingdom Plantae. I won't ask that on the lab exam because I know it's the classification is confusing. But folks, what I could ask is what's this beautiful green structure? That's a beautiful helical green chloroplast. Chlorophyll A carries out oxygenic photosynthesis. In the, in the spirogyra, folks, the, um, this is one cell right here. You can see it's forming a beautiful chain of cells. Some of your slides showed spirogyra um, undergoing sexual reproduction. Um, so spirogyra can reproduce both asexually and sexually. Here, folks, is a photomicrograph of, um, again, could come from a pond or an aquarium. This is our aquatic plant, Elodea. Oops, sorry. And so um, cell wall, cytoplasmic membrane. It, there's a nucleus here, which you can't see, but these little green guys are the chloroplasts evolved from primitive cyanobacteria. They're green because of chlorophyll A. They carry out oxygenic photosynthesis, thus they're photoautotrophs. Oops, I should go back up here. And folks, the same thing with the spirogyra. Um, they carry out oxygenic photosynthesis, thus they're photoautotrophs. All right, we're um, moving to a new kingdom. We're moving to kingdom fungi. So we made wet mounts in lab this week of baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And here you can see they're carrying out the cool process of asexual reproduction called budding. So that's classic for yeast. Saccharomyces carries out alcoholic fermentation. They take sugars and convert them to carbon dioxide and ethanol and alcohol. Um, they're called baker's yeast because the carbon dioxide they release um, helps to make leaven bread when we want our bread dough to rise. The ethanol is baked off during the ethanol evaporates during baking, so when you eat baked bread, there's no alcohol. Um, Saccharomyces is also called brewer's yeast. Brewers are folks that make beer, so it's used to make beer or wine. Um, so the Saccharomyces will take the sugars from the, the flour or sugars from the grape juice, carry out alcoholic fermentation. And so the, the alcohol we find in beer and wine, again, is a product of alcoholic fermentation of Saccharomyces. Classification, cellular, eukaryotes, domain eukarya, kingdom fungi. Um, and with kingdom fungi, folks, remember they're chemoheterotrophs. They need preformed organic molecules as a source of, of food. <laughs> I keep doing that. They need preformed organic molecules both as a source of energy and carbon. Fungi have cell walls made out of chitin. They have um, cell membrane, cytoplasmic membrane that have that, cool, that that has that cool sterol called ergosterol, and you'll recall, you guys, ergosterol is a target of amphotericin B, um, and also azoles will inhibit the synthesis of ergosterol. So both amphotericin B and azoles will cause the fungal cell membranes to get leaky. Um, the fungi they're not motile. Let's see here. Oh, yes, I remember you guys. So um, many fungi, well, let me back up. All fungi can reproduce asexually. So here we have budding, right, in the yeast. Um, most fungi can also reproduce sexually, and that's kind of confusing for us humans. We're not used to organisms doing both. But most fungi can reproduce sexually. And you'll recall in the fungal lab, that was originally how fungi were classified, was according to sexual reproduction. Many, well, some fungi have lost the ability to reproduce sexually. And in the old days, they were called uh, fungi imperfecti, or the deuteromycetes. But with DNA sequencing, it was discovered that most of the imperfect fungi um, were actually ascomycetes. So we'll come back to that in the fungal unit. So... This next specimen, you guys, and I know this is a little bit confusing, this specimen and this specimen, they look really different. And well, there's two different stains, so that's a, that's a challenge. But structurally, they look really different. But this is an example of a fungus that is reproducing asexually here and sexually here. This is Rhizopus. 
our bread mold. And so with um, asexual reproduction, you guys remember the rhizopus will form this aerial hypha, grows into the air, and then we'll have this balloon-like structure of the sporangium at the end. And the sporangium makes the sporangiospores, the asexual spores, right? And then over here, this is sexual reproduction in rhizopus, where we have two different parents, parent one and parent two. They're going to meet and combine their genetic information to make the sexual spore the zygospore. And consequently, we know that rhizopus is a zygomycetes because it makes zygospores. Fungi are really important recyclers in nature. Most of them are what we call saprobes. They, they use dead animals, dead plants, as the preformed organic molecules. But we'll discover in the second fungal lab, some fungi don't wait until we die to, to digest us. So some fungi we'll see are actually parasites. They invade other organisms and cause harm. Okay, let's see. Okay, you guys, so um, this, we're almost finished here. So these are two members of Kingdom Animalia. This is the, the resting sage. This is Dicericus of Taniasolium, the pork tapeworm. This is our blood-feeding female mosquito, Aedes aegypti. So these guys, they're multicellular. They're eukaryotes, domain eukarya. They belong to um, Kingdom Animalia, just as we do. The Taniasolium, the pork tapeworm, um, the problem is, is if we eat fecal contaminated food that has um, feces from, a, uh, say, a person that's been infected with taniosolium, the eggs will um, hatch in our intestine, releasing baby worms, little larvae. They penetrate the intestine. They spread throughout our bodies. And they love to end up in our brain, where they'll form these little resting stages, these cystocerci. And that can cause severe brain damage. That's referred to as neurocystosarcosis, and it's one of the one of the uh, major causes of epilepsy worldwide. Another way we can get infected is that if we eat um, pig tissue, pork, and we don't cook it sufficiently, and if the pork has these resting cystocerci in it, um, they survive passage through the stomach, and then the little worms emerge in our intestine. They latch on to the wall of our intestine using their scolex, their heads, which have hooks and suckers on them, and then they start growing in little segments that are chock full of eggs, and then those eggs get passed in the feces. With our mosquitoes, the reason we study them, they're really big, so you might say, why do we study mosquitoes in microbiology lab? Because they're wonderful arthropod vectors. They can transfer microbial pathogens from one host to an another. The Aedes aegypti is called the yellow fever mosquito because it transfers yellow fever virus. It can transfer all, uh, many other viruses, including Zika virus, um, dengue virus, chikungunya virus. And unfortunately, it's just been identified there's some breeding populations of Aedes aegypti here in Northern California, so that's not good. Um, in addition, we'll study the Anopheles mosquitoes, which, which transmit transmit the protozoal parasite plasmodium that causes malaria. Here in this northern California Sacramento region, Culex mosquitoes transmit West Nile virus. And then when we study um, helmets, we'll see that mosquitoes can also transmit um, um, filarial worms, um, which cause lymphatic filariasis or elephantiasis. Here in northern California, um, there is the um, a dog filarial worm, the dog heart worm, dirofilaria imidis, and those two are transmitted by mosquitoes. So folks, I think we'll stop here. Um, this, this is probably going to be the last recording for today. So um, over the next week, I'll try to make additional recordings so we cover all of our lab um, homework study guide packets, both A1 and A2. So we'll have recordings for all of the units um, that will be on our lab exam, lab practical one.